Hi, I'm Mike Halper, and thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is Israel-Ukrainian relations. Things are getting tense. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has repeatedly called Israel out and chastised the Jewish state for not doing enough to help Ukrainians fight their battle with Russia. Recently, he did it again. Zelensky said that the Israeli government is not offering his country sufficient help to fight the Russians who invaded his country on February 24th, 2022. At the time, he was speaking via Zoom to students and faculty at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. The president of Ukraine, a master communicator, a performer, first acknowledged that he appreciated the help of the Israeli people. And then he gave a real zetz, a real slap to the Israeli government. Speaking gently and yet forcefully, Zelensky said, quote, we will in future have to look into each other's eyes. On Friday, we will mark four months since the Russians invaded Ukraine and Moscow declared war against Kiev. I think you have all witnessed what a tragedy it is, but nevertheless, I'm sure we will prevail and win, unquote. Zelensky spoke about how disappointed he is with Israel. He spoke about how he, the Jewish president of Ukraine, and Israel have a shared past. He reminded his rapt audience that major Israeli pioneer heroes came from Ukraine, Yitzhak ben Svi, Golda Meir, and Shalom Aleichem, who, by the way, actually settled in the United States, not Israel, and wrote in Yiddish, not Hebrew. Zelensky called Russia a, quote, terror state, unquote. He said, and I'm quoting again, they attack and destroy our cities and they burn everything in their path. Describing the devastation in Mariupol, he said that there was virtually nothing left of the city. Russian artillery virtually wiped it out, he said. Four months ago, half a million people lived in the city. Now only a few tens of thousands are left. And then came the Zets again the slap. Quote, the Ukrainian people are grateful to the Israeli people for waving our national flag on the streets. And we appreciate the gesture very much. We thank the Israeli people, but we also ask for the support of your government. Luxembourg, with a population of some 600,000 people, provided us defensive aid equal to 15% of their defense budget. But what about Israel? We understand this is not an easy situation, but we would like to see greater support, unquote. Then another Zets came, the slap. Zelensky said he expects Israel to join the sanctions against Russia. In his words, quote, unfortunately, we haven't seen Israel joining yet, unquote. Ukraine is turning the proverbial screws on Israel. Despite the field hospital, the food, the transport to Israel, the accepting of immigrants, the granting them of citizenship, the mediation from Israel's highest level to Russia's highest level to Ukraine's highest level, Ukraine, i.e. Vladimir Zelensky, wants more. And then, even more than that, the man has chutzpah, there's no doubt. Ukraine's ambassador to Israel came just short of demanding that Israel give his country Israel's prized anti-missile interception battery, the Iron Dome. Putting the Iron Dome in the battlefield in Ukraine is as good as guaranteeing that it would fall into Russian hands, and from there, who knows where. And in March, when Zelensky addressed the Knesset, again via Zoom, he made, albeit a powerful, moving, heart-wrenching, a similar set of demands. He also made similar demands and exaggerated claims paralleling the events in Ukraine to the Holocaust. And he explained that Israelis certainly should understand the parallel. Israelis and Jews around the world were insulted and yet still extremely moved. Why does Zelensky castigate Israel for not doing enough? They must do more. Might it be because he personally is Jewish and expects more from the Jewish state? No, I don't think so. Is it possible? Because it's because tiny little Israel has been the victim of aggression and attacked in onslaught 
after onslaught by its Arab and Muslim neighbors and should feel empathy for Ukraine being attacked by the huge Russia? No, I don't think so. Is it because, just like Ukraine, Israel is in the right, despite the claims of her enemy interlopers? No, I don't think so. Israel can handle the charges of neglect and of not doing enough. Critique of Israel is de rigueur. It is okay to criticize Israel. It is okay to call Israel on the carpet and to pressure Israel. Israel does not need to justify her actions and list the things she has done to help and assist Ukraine, and so many other countries, by the way, and other peoples in need. And Israel should not throw that back into Zelensky's face. Another example is Kiev considering suspending its visa-free agreement with Israel. They are peeved about Israel's policy on Ukrainian refugees. Ukrainian ambassador to Israel, Yevgen Kornerchuk, told Israeli-Russian language news, Detali, that Israel is not playing fair. This is what he said. Russian citizens enter Israel without restrictions. Belarusians enter citizens as well. Ukrainian citizens have invented electronic visas. Neither I nor my management can help but take this painfully. We are now considering whether to suspend the visa-free regime for Israelis in response. It will be imperceptible now, but before Rosh Hashanah, the Israeli government will feel it. The ambassador was referring to the pilgrimage of religious Jews who flocked to Uman during the High Holidays. All the way back in March, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky's chief of staff, Andrei Yermak, made the same threat. He called the electronic permit system, quote, an unfriendly step for citizens of Ukraine, unquote. Kwinechik also expressed disappointment with Israel's stance on the Russian invasion, saying Ukraine, quote, expects any form of help from our partners, but do not sit on the shore waiting for someone to start winning. Israel needs to act in her own best interest. And while there's no doubt that confronting Russian aggression is important, so too is keeping on good terms with Russia. The Russians control Syria, and Iran is outfitting Hezbollah in Syria. And that's why Israel has been a mediator between Russia and Ukraine. Israel understands both sides in this conflict, intimately, diplomatically. Israel understands. Zelensky is charismatic, appealing, extremely telegenetic. But when it comes to Israel, this newbie political leader would be more successful if he asked politely as opposed to preaching Musa and delivering morality sermons. Coming up, points of view. First up is an editorial from AP, AKA the Associated Press. It's what they call an explainer. We've spoken about this before. AP gives background about the subject. This is a great example. It's so good that Ynet put it on their website to explain Israeli politics, especially Israeli election politics. The piece is entitled, Why is Israel Always Holding Elections? Subtitled, Explainer, Ideologically Diverse Social Makeup and Deep Divide Over Whether Benjamin Netanyahu Should Be Prime Minister Are Some of the Reasons Sending Israelis Back to the Polls Time and Again. It was published on June 22nd, 2022. The premise of this piece is to explain why Israel is having elections again and how Israel's democracy actually works. They begin. After barely 12 months in office, the leaders of Israel's broad-based but severely weakened coalition government threw in the towel this week, saying they would dissolve parliament and hold new elections, the fifth in three and a half years. Why does this keep happening? The simplest answer is that Israel is deeply, almost evenly divided over whether Benjamin Netanyahu should be prime minister. But it's also because Israel's political system consists of an ideologically diverse array of parties that have to form alliances and sometimes break them to get what they want. The AP is 100% correct. Israel is a country that's split in half, almost exactly, and there is no change in sight. So, now again, there will be a split.
The AP goes on and explains that half the nation sees Bibi Netanyahu as a gifted world leader, a defender of Israel, a strong nationalist. For the other half, he's a crook and a megalomaniac and a threat to democracy. And that's the split. With this fifth election in so few years, as the country is almost certainly destined to remain split, Bibi is looking to make a comeback. <laughs> Will it happen? It is far too early for reliable polling to make a call on this. The election won't take place until the end of October. But the AP concludes with its explainer this way, quote, but it's far too early for any reliable polling. And even if Netanyahu and his allies secure more seats, they could fall short of a majority yet again. If that happens, it would be left to many of the same parties that form the outgoing government to cobble together a new coalition, one that would face the same stressors as the last one. And if neither side has enough support to form a government, you guessed it, new elections. This is an excellent, solid piece. Thank you so very much, AP. Next up is a column from Ynet. It's authored by Kobe Nachshoni, and it was published on June 24th, 2022. The title of this column is Ultra-Orthodox Parties Fear Vote Drain as Haredi Youth Turns to Far Right. It's subtitled, and the subtitles are very long. That's the beauty of the internet. It's subtitled, Analysis, as more and more young religious Jews find Firebrand MK, Itamar Ben Gvir's political ideas appealing, Haredi party leaders become concerned with Otsma Yehudit stealing votes from ultra-Orthodox in upcoming elections. Here's a bit of the background. Israel's right-wing Zionist parties, especially the party named Jewish Power Party, or Otsma Yehudit, resonate with young Haredi ultra-religious Jewish men. And it looks like they will leech many of these young voters from other Haredi ultra-religious parties. For some, this is very worrisome. Itmar Ben Gvir is the head of Otzma Yudi, the Kach party, the party that was founded by Mayor Kahana. Kach was the Israeli version of the JDL, the Jewish Defense League from the United States. In order to sway their voters away from Ben Gvir, Haredi leaders are painting Ben Gvir as an extremist. What they do not understand is that for those who are being swayed, being an extremist is exactly the point. It's exactly the attraction. This is how Nachshani begins. After years in which far-right MK Itamar Ben Gvir was relentlessly denounced by the left, the leader of Otzma Yehudi, Jewish Power Party, recently had to contend with similar treatment from the right side of the political map. His increasing popularity among the religious Jewish youth is starting to worry Haredi parties as the fresh elections approach elections following the announcement on the dissolution of the Knesset. As a result, the Haredi parties have been making effort to differentiate themselves from Ben Gvir and denounce him in what seems to be the beginning of a planned election campaign. On Saturday, Chief Rabbi of Israel, Yitzchak Yosef, claimed Ben Gvir's provocations on the Temple Mount were sacrilegious. The comments were immediately interpreted as his attempts to aid the ultra-Orthodox Shas party with which he is affiliated. Ben Gvir's fascination with religion appears to be less threatening to Likud and other secular right-wing parties, and more so to religious and Haredi ones. The parties fear he will use his growing popularity to run in primary elections held by United Torah Judaism or Shas parties, even though Ben Gvir made clear he has no plans to run for head of his party. This is how Nachshani explains the Haredi response to Ben Gvir. He writes, Israel's Haredi society was once seen as unaffiliated deeply with any on the political arena, 
But recently that began to change, and Ben Gvir knows this well. He aims to target a younger, more modern, and right-leaning Haredi population, which doesn't see itself as a blind follower of its religious leaders and wants to be involved in issues that are more important to them outside of the Torah. The ultra-Orthodox party's primarily line of defense so far has been focused on attacking Ben Gvir's right views, but painting him as a careless provocateur whose deeds raise tensions and cause bloodshed. Nachshoni concludes by quoting Haredi journalist Yaakov Rivlin. And it's important to note because the Haredi journalist Yaakov Rivlin actually has tremendous insight into his community. The Haredi journalist Yaakov Rivlin, a veteran political commentator and news editor of the weekly Baki Ilah, also points to a possible migration of votes from ultra-Orthodox factions to religious Zionist party. But in his opinion, this is only relevant when it comes to Ashkenazi voters. Among United Torah Judaism voter base, there are right-wing fringes who do find it difficult to connect well enough with their party, and there we see a leakage of electorate to Ben Gvir, who is making good use of it, he said. On the other hand, Shas, despite its past adventures with the left, has in recent years managed to consolidate its position as sufficiently right-wing in the eyes of its voters, and the party is less threatened electorally by Ben Gvir. This is going to be a very interesting election in October, and where those votes fall might determine the next prime minister. It's very, very interesting. We'll keep watching. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. I want to show you four cartoons and memes today. I also want to show you a quick humorous video. First up is a meme about the price of gas. This theme is a, of the price of gas continues to be the subject of so many cartoons and memes all over on the internet and newspapers across the board. The caption reads, the prophecy has been fulfilled. We see a sign at a 7-Eleven store, which also has a gas station. And of course, the gas price is $7.00. And 11 cents. This next meme is a picture of a Diet Coke box. It reads 15 cans, three more cans than a 12 pack. That's what happens when you don't teach math. That's funny. Next up is a delightful play on the quintessential Oreo cookie, comparing it to the Mayan calendar. Looking at the design side by side and comparing them, the similarities are shocking. The caption reads, in biscuits we trust. According to the Mayan calendar, the world is ending this month. Fortunately, Oreo Cookie says, don't worry. This is so funny. I still cannot figure out how the Oreo Cookie design is so similar to the Mayan calendar. There has to be a reason somewhere, but I'll keep looking. This last meme, again, makes fun of the price of gas. The meme reads, Gas was $6.29 per gallon. Filled my tank. The total came to $125.98. Drove off without paying. Court date, March 22nd. Fine $70. Savings, $55.98. Follow me for more money tips. When I read this the first time, I could not stop from laughing out loud. It is simply hilarious. I hope you're laughing as well. Finally, this is a humor skit by Oracle Lydia. It makes fun of just how dependent we are on our cell phones. It reminds me of the genre humor that once was all over the place about. It was called, Where Are My Glasses? Watch and Enjoy. You know, sometimes, you know, as much as you try to fight the whole change and aging process, sometimes things happen that just so strong in your face, just smacks you dead in your face, that you just have to go, okay, it is what it is. It's a true story. I'm, I'm coming out of the mall, right? Walking out of the mall and, and I'm just digging through my purse, just rifling through my bag. And, and you know, I'm talking to my friend and, and she could tell that I was distracted. She's like, Wanda, are you listening to me? I was like, girl, I'm sorry, but I think I left my cell phone in the store. <laughs> And she goes, okay, well, 
call me back when you find it. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. A report just has just been leaked about a secret meeting between senior Arab military leaders and Israel's IDF chief of staff, Lieutenant General Aviv Kochavi, who all met in Sharm el-Sheikh in March. The secret meeting was convened to discuss countering regional threats posed by Iran. Details of the meeting, which were sponsored by the United States, were reported by the Wall Street Journal. Then, Head of Central Command, General Frank McKenzie, brought together the top military commanders from Israel, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Egypt, and Jordan. Included in the group was Saudi Arabia's Chief of Staff, General Fayyad Ibn Hamad al Ruwali. Two important notes are that while the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain also sent officers to the meeting, they did not send their military chiefs. And Kuwait and Oman did not participate at all. The Wall Street Journal reported that officials reached an agreement in principle on procedures for rapid notification when aerial threats are detected. The IDF spokesperson unit issued a statement explaining that earlier senior IDF officials held a three-day long strategic operational meeting with a delegation of senior officials from CENTCOM, the United States Central Command. The meeting centered on a joint tabletop exercise during which a dialogue which was held regarding shared regional security challenges and joint preparations for scenarios of regional escalation. That's all a part of the official statement. The move to CENTCOM is believed to not only simplify cooperation with American troops in the region, it can also create the potential for regional coalition with Arab countries that have normalized ties with Israel against shared threats posed by Iran. Increased cooperation with CENTCOM and the Gulf states is expected to give Jerusalem a leg up in terms of dealing with the threat posed by Tehran. Iran announced that Qatar will host indirect talks between Iran and the United States. Their topic will be the revival of Tehran's 2015 nuclear deal with world powers. The announcement was made by Mohammad Marandi, a media advisor to the Iranian nuclear team. Speaking to the semi-official ISNA news agency, Marandi said, Iran chose Qatar to host because it is our friend. This is a major step forward in negotiations over revitalizing the stalled talks around the nuke deal. It is also important to note that this move places Qatar in a pivotal role, not just in this one case, but as a serious player in the entire Middle East. Defense Minister Benny Gans said that all arms of defense establishment were working in tandem to oppose the threat of a nuclear Iran. Gans made his point in response to reports that have begun to surface about disagreements between the military and intelligence agencies in Israel. Benny Gans said, the defense establishment is dealing with the Iranian threat day and night as the most important and urgent strategic issue currently for Israel's security. This is done in coordination between all the security arms with freedom of opinion while the political echelon makes the decision. This is important given the European Union's announcement that world powers and Iran have decided to restart the long-stalled talks on the revival of Tehran's nuclear program and Iran's announcement about Qatar hosting those talks. Israel has built a fake Gaza city in the middle of a military base named Saladim, located in the Negev Desert in the south of Israel. This fake city is so very realistic and true to detail that even the Muazin, the Muslim call to prayer, is sounded five times a day, just like in every other Muslim city. Other than members of the IDF, the city is deserted. This Israeli-built fake city cannot be found on any map. Officially, it's known as the Urban Warfare Training Center. Israeli soldiers who run military drills call it Mini Gaza. The IDF began building Mini Gaza in 2005 at a cost of $45 million. According to the facility's commander, Colonel Eli Abelis, the nature of war has changed. Today, our principal fighting is done around built-up areas. The tight alleyways, drab concrete buildings, 
and open areas is roughly 60 acres or a quarter square kilometer. The facilities are meant to simulate the urban environments in which Israeli soldiers often operate. The IDF has an official graffiti artist who decorated the buildings with murals featuring Arab slogans and portraits of Palestinian and Lebanese militants and their leaders. Between exercises, soldiers rest in the shade of 500 buildings Israel has built, the tallest being eight stories high, just like in Gaza. They smoke cigarettes beneath the faded posters, some of which honor the Palestinian fighters killed in battle with Israel. Other soldiers don red and white checkered scarves to play the militants in upcoming drills. The training center can accommodate exercises for an entire brigade of 2,000 soldiers at a single time, visiting American troops and forces from European allies, most recently Cypriot soldiers, have also trained in mini Gaza. This fake city is as realistic as you get. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that Oreo cookies made by Nabisco only became kosher in 1997? Before that, the Oreo was made with lard, certainly not kosher. The change came about and it was spearheaded by Professor Joe Regenstein, who was a professor at Cornell University School of Food Science. He was also an advisor to Nabisco. The stimulus was the rise of kosher ice cream, at least the way he tells it. Almost all big brands of ice cream were kosher and they were making Oreo cookie ice cream. They wanted to use the real thing, real Oreos, not imitations. But they couldn't do that and remain kosher. At the very same time, there was a healthy eating push away from lard, a push to remove saturated fats from our food. That helped a lot. The transformation took three and a half years. It was probably the most expensive conversion of a country from non-kosher to kosher ever. Think about it, over a hundred baking ovens measuring over 300 feet long, nearly the length of a football field had to be converted from tray for non-kosher to kosher ovens. The cost was $150,000. Nabisco was shocked when they were told that a blowtorch was needed to make all the ovens kosher. A couple of interesting notes. 40% of all packaged foods have kosher certification and 80% of the consumers of kosher food are non-Jewish. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Alpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. Mm -hmm.